it is biases racism anti-blackness that's that's just ingrained there we got an uphill battle to, to fight one of them is calling out white liberals that see themselves as an ally and you know, fighting for equality and all of that when in actuality they are in opposition of, of equality and Mel Kay addresses that in this same book he says the white liberal must arm that absolute justice for the negro simply mean in the in the aristotelian sense that the negro must have quote his due there is nothing abstract about this it is a, it is as concrete as having a good job a good education a decent house and a share of power it is however important to understand that giving a man his due may often mean giving him special treatment i am aware of the fact that this has been a troublesome concept for many liberals since it conflicts with their traditional idea of equal opportunity and equal treatment of people according to their individual merit we know don't exist but this is the day which demand new things and the re-evaluation of old concepts a society that has done something special against the negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for him in order to equip him to compete on a just and equal basis that's very simple i'll go on the white liberal must rid himself of the notion that there can be a tensionless transition from the old order of injustice to the new order of justice two things are clear to me and i hope they are clear to white liberals one is that the negro cannot achieve emancipation through violent rebellion the other is that the negro cannot achieve emancipation by passively waiting for the white race to voluntarily grant it to him the negro has not gained a single right in america without persistent pressure and agitation however lamentable it may seem the negro is now convinced that the white america will never admit to him equal rights unless it is coerced into doing non-violent coercion always brings tension to the surface this tension however must not be seen as destructive there is a kind of tension that is both healthy and necessary for growth society needs non-violent gadflies to bring its tension into the open and force its citizens to confront the ugliness of their prejudices and the tragedy of their racism it is important for the liberal to see that the oppressed person who agitates for his right is not the creator of the tension he merely brings out the hidden tension that is already alive last summer when we had our open housing marches in chicago many of our white liberal friends cried out in horror and dismay you're creating hatred and his hostility in the white communities in which you are marching you are only developing a white backlash Boy, that sound familiar. i never could understand this logic this is dr king speaking they failed to realize that the hatred and the hostility were already latently or subconsciously present our marches merely brought them to the surface how strange it would be to condemn a physician who through persistent work and the ingenuity of his medical skills discovered cancer in a patient would anyone be so ignorant as to say he caused the cancer through the skills and discipline of direct action we reveal that there is a dangerous cancer of hatred and racism in our society we did not cause the cancer we merely exposed it only through this kind of exposure will the cancer ever be cured the committed white liberal must see the need for powerful antidote to come the disease of racism that's the and yeah that was in the city you can believe it but it's also something that we we say today we have to say today we have to point out today because they're doing the same thing king's frustration with white liberals was real he saw them as folks who would pat you on the back in public but wouldn't stand up when it really mattered they were all about civil rights as long as it didn't upset their comfortable lives too much now that also brings me to um dr king's stance on the vietnam war and the reason he was in memphis when he was assassinated his opposition to the vietnam war marked let's say it marked a significant public shift in his activism uh he gave a speech called beyond vietnam and he declared a time comes when silence is betrayal and he gave this speech at a uh, riverside church in new york city on april 4 1967 the speech was called beyond vietnam he says i am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution we 
we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of value. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motive, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarianism are incapable of being conquered. And that speech, he boldly criticized the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War and also linked the war to issues of social justice, including racism, materialism, militarism. His stance was controversial, and this was because it connected the domestic policies of the U.S. with foreign policies of the U.S. Basically shitted on the fundamentals of American society and capitalism. But you, we know that's... that's that's what we do. And dance and his movement started to look to be more global, focusing on foreign policy, on U.S. foreign policy. He was challenging the notion that domestic and foreign policies are separate. He saw the war as an extension of the injustices he fought against at home. It was draining resources and attention from the civil rights movement and the war on poverty. He basically said, if I stand for justice, I can't ignore this. He also said that, uh, he also talked about, and we, I'm actually going to and follow up with this episode i'm going to talk about the vietnam war and how it intersected with the civil rights movement it was actually a pretty it was a big a uh, it it made a it made a huge difference in the movement and what and how things how, how certain things were accomplished legislatively though i don't think those two things could have happened to separately and we still have the outcomes that we had i think with the vietnam war it actually made the legislation for it made the civil rights legislation happen a lot more easier also during the the era of the civil rights in the vietnam war there was a draft and young people were being drafted so that increased the participation in voting because you know these young people were being drafted and they was like hell no why the hell are we being drafted why are we getting drafted to the war there's also a lot to look at there was disparities in the vietnam war too another reason why dr king spoke against it because there were two things at play one was black people were disproportionately being drafted over white people even though we were only about 13 percent of the population we were being drafted more Uh, the other thing was uh black people were dying more during the vietnam war disproportionate we're only 13 percent of the population yet we were the ones that were dying at a higher rate than uh white he's saying you telling us that we have to go out here and fight another country for quote-unquote freedom and democracy yet we are here and we are not even free and we can't even participate in democracy but you telling us to go to vietnam and fight in a war for somebody else's freedom which i don't even know how we can even i mean (laughs) can we even say that that was freedom that's the lie you sell us that we should go over here to fight for the freedom of these people yet i'm not even free here i'm not even free here right now then you had veterans that were in coming home from vietnam Mom? There were some veterans that were in World War II with the Nazi, and they were coming home being murdered, killed, mistreated. They didn't even respect black people in the uniform. During the bus boycotts, I believe in Montgomery, a veteran was murdered on the bus. MLK had to address them at some point. So people look at it like, you know, him dabbling to U.S. foreign policy. No, that foreign policy did not just affect people overseas in the countries that we were warring with. It was actually affecting us here at home and i mean it was affecting specifically black people and so it was something that eventually would have had to be addressed but and i plan to follow up with about the just some basic facts about the vietnam war and how the vietnam war was necessary for us to achieve that legislation that was during the 60s now of which most of it has been rolled back now let's go on to memphis so dr king was in memphis for a reason okay the purpose of him being there was to support the sanitation workers right the workers were protesting inhumane working conditions and were in racial discrimination they their slogan i am a man statement of dignity against degrading treatment this is what dr king did he went to those marches he was in the trenches he just didn't give speeches he went out there and he told 
tell people to protest march and all of those non-violent protests he did it he didn't just tell people to do it he also did it because he realized it wasn't just another stop on the civil rights trail it was about something bigger and that was economic justice dr king knew that the fight for civil rights was only half the battle for him it wasn't enough to just sit at the same lunch counter as white folks if you could afford the meal it was about more than that and we also know that and i think i talked about that a little bit that we didn't want to just it wasn't come on now we wasn't just sitting up there trying to eat the same lunch counter the purpose of the nonviolent protest was for something much more greater than just eating on side of white people there was a book i read and it talked about the emancipated slaves after the civil war who were asked some questions and when they came up with the whole reconstruction plan he asked the 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 formerly enslaved men and women if they wanted to be in community with white people if they wanted to live with them they said no they said no no we don't want us we don't want to be near y'all we we know what y'all do we know how y'all are we we just want to be over there by ourselves doing our own thing building and living and just being regular a hundred years later really changed they, they wasn't asking to sit and be in community with white people they were just asking to get what was due that's all and dr king understood that which is why he went to memphis he knew that it was about economic injustice in memphis the memphis sanitation strike began in february 1968 it was a big deal in the civil rights movement and uh, in the labor rights movement in the United States because the labor unions before, there were laws against black people joining labor unions. Okay, that's one thing. <laughs> yeah, weird, huh? And, and the white people within the labor unions did not want black people to join their union stupid right you need labor union and everyone has to be a part of it here's why this is what happened when those labor unions exclude black people what they did was anytime they threatened a strike they said okay all right strike and what would happen when they went on strike they went and hired all the black people who was excluded from joining the labor union excluded from getting their fair equal pay excluded all of these things that white people was excluding black people from it's it, it blew up in their face with the labor unions every time because what would happen the damn companies would just say well i got somebody who can do the work go ahead go y'all asses on strike matter of fact stay on it because i'm gonna pay the negro here to do the work and then i'm gonna pay him less than what i pay you so now you potentially out of a job and then what they would do of course is blame the negro for taking a job no first of all you told me i couldn't join the union i would have been on the other side with your ass if you would have allowed me to join the union but you didn't so now either i have my own union i mean and then i advocate for us <laughs> in our way but it was actually a law in i want to say it was one of the southern states it could have been mississippi louisiana texas i don't know there was a law against black people joining union yeah there was a law against it and that law kind of goes all the way back to ooh, 18 1871 maybe i want to say that's how far back that law goes um because there was a time when yeah the workers were united including void of race they were all united black and white and then the power structure came in and said no we can't have y'all together so what they did they enticed the other side which was white to uh, not be in league with black and so yeah they forged the divide bam now you have yeah now you have unions that were you had labor unions that were dominated by whites but were not successful in anything because they they could never threaten a strike and so the strike was initiated by african-american sanitation workers after two workers echo cole and robert walker were crushed to death by a malfunctioning garbage truck on february 1st 1968 so the incident brought to the forefront the poor working conditions, low wages, racial discrimination faced by the sanitation workers, predominantly African American, were subjected to unsafe working environments and, of course, unequal treatment compared to their white counterpoint. Their slogan, I am a man, that kind of tells you that these were primarily men, but it was to uh, symbolize their demand for dignity, respect, and fair labor practices. Involvement in supporting Memphis sanitation workers, it was significant because it, it also showed that he would get down in the trenches it didn't matter and even though that's where he was murdered he often said that he felt like his life was always in danger so there wasn't a time there wasn't a moment where he thought oh 
oh i better not go here and do this because i could potentially be murdered no he went anyway because it was like if i go anywhere i could potentially be murdered the way that they were bombing and blowing up other shit they did the same to him he always felt like his life was in danger i don't doubt if he was at if he was in memphis if he was in somewhere else i don't think it would have mattered they would have killed him anyway they 